that our, our young people have been going on. It's amazing. So you might want to go to the youth Instagram and get some word and some creativity in there. Anyway, um, so I was just waffling while you got to that. All right, so today we continue our series called Prodigal Love, and I want to say to you, there is more love for you. There is more for you. There is more of God. God is infinite. God is bigger than you. God doesn't fit into your box, my box, or a box. God is, is bigger than. He is more than. And I just want to encourage you, if uh, no matter whether you feel far from Him or close to Him, to say, God, there is more. You are, the, the book of Ephesians says, therefore God is able to do more than you can ask for, think of, or imagine by His mighty power working in you. And I want to encourage you, don't settle but just steps forward and say, in faith, say, God, I want all of you. I want to know you more. I want to know the length, the breadth, the height, the depth of your love. Um, I want to know it. I want to experience it. And I want to give it. If you've got it, you can give it. Isn't that good news? What you're going to get today and what you are getting today, you can give. The city desperately needs prodigal love. Now, when you think about the word prodigal, you may think about the prodigal son the story of the prodigal son, and um, we are actually in the series putting ourselves in the shoe of the prodigal son who went looking for love in all the wrong places and at some point came to his senses and made a life-changing decision and said these words, I am going to get up and go home to my father. Everything changed when he made that decision. But the word prodigal is not just uh, it's not just a negative word. It's also positive. And, 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 and I want us to catch both these meanings in this series. The negative of it is to spend money or use resources freely, wastefully, uh, recklessly, just like, just like the prodigal son. I mean, he got it all and he wasted it all away. And then there's the positive side of it, which is, or meaning of the word, which is to, to have or give something on a lavish scale to have it and to give it. And here's the deal. When you and I can put ourselves into and see how it's so easy to waste our lives away, easy to, get it, to just live a, in a way that, that is recklessly wasting the life we've been given. And when we connect with the God who has everything and lavishly gives it away, when those two come together, amazing things can happen. So that's what we want to experience today. I don't know if you feel your life is like you've wrecked your life, you've wasted your life. Um, I just want you to know there is a God who has much and He's ready to come onto your prodigalness with His prodigalness and everything can change when that happens. Are you okay with that? Um, let's quickly... Uh, just get a bit of a view of this through a little video. Excessive, extravagant, and reckless. All things considered, his love is quite childlike. And might I even suggest, sometimes downright ridiculous. I didn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, but he's just that good. So today we're talking about the love we're all longing for, and we're going to get back into the uh, story, the, the, the story Jesus told, and, and, and go on a journey looking for a love that I want to tell you you're all looking for. We're all looking for this love. We may not know it, um, but let's just get into the shoes of the prodigal son and see where it takes us. So let's go to Luke chapter 15. Luke is one of the Gospels, one of the accounts of the life of Jesus. And here we go. In, this is verse 11 of Luke 15. In a moment, we're going to get there. Just, just a sec. So Jesus is telling some stories. And in Luke 15, verse 11, it reads like this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them the story. A man had two sons. Now, I want us just to pause a little bit and remember, what is the point? You know, if you can understand why somebody is telling this story, you can understand the story. 
And I just want us to pause here before we get into the story, and Marissa's going to read it for us. Just, just let's remind ourselves of the point. The beginning of the chapter is like this. Jesus is hanging out with a, f- a, a bunch of uh, tax collectors and notorious sinners. He's eating with them. He's teaching them. They're coming to him. And there are some religious people, some Pharisees, and they're looking at this, and they start to complain. And they say, how can you hang out with these sinners and these tax collectors? They complained that Jesus welcomed them. And as they, as they did this, as Jesus is hanging out with these people that he loves and he wants to see restored, and he sees these Pharisees, these teachers of the law complaining, something rises up in Jesus and he says, I've got to explain this to you. I've got to explain to you what God is really like. And this is why he told these stories. So just see the, the pictures. Many came to Jesus They were sinners. They were looking for hope. They were looking for forgiveness. They were looking for some direction, whatever they were looking for. Then they complained, and Jesus says, I've got to explain to you what God is really like. Um, Why is it important that you know what somebody is really like? Yeah, what, what what you know and believe about somebody will determine how you relate to them. There you go. Rico's got it, man. He's done follow one. Okay, what, what you know and believe about somebody will determine how you relate to them. This is crucial. So Jesus says, look, if you're going to know God, Pharisees, if you're going to know God, legal people, if you're going to know God, sinners, if you're going to know God, tax collectors, any tax collectors here? If you're going to know God, uh, disciples, if you're going to know God, I need to make sure you understand what He is like. And so He told them the story, and that's where we pick it up. And today we want to specifically focus on, do you know God as good, perfect Father? Do you? Because if you do, this is the big point of this message, if you do, when you know God as perfect Father, everything will change for you. I'm going to ask Marissa, student and hosting team member, to... (laughs) To read us this text. So this is from Luke 15. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home... Even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father. All right, we're going to stop there for a moment because there's, at this point we might be itching. What, what, what happens? What happens? All right, and part of our homework for, from last week was to pause three times this past week and read through Luke 15 and say and, and imagine that this is, you're trying to find out what God is like and who he is and what he's like, and and from the story, you're trying to hear that from what Jesus said. So you continue to do that again this week, all right? But we're going to pause here because when you get to this last phrase, I will go home to my father, something in you should actually pause, be arrested, and say, why would he now decide to go home? I mean, just a little while back, he left his father. Just a little while back, he, he, he rejected his father. Just a little while back, he wanted nothing to do with his father. Now he's gone on a bit of a trip. And now, suddenly, he says, I want to go back to the father. I mean, what happened? What happened between that day and this day? Mm-hmm. Because, and listen, if you get this, this is, this is, the, this is what we want to drill in today. So you can make all sorts of decisions, but, but if you know what's driving you and, and how you actually get to make those decisions, everything will change for you. 
So what happened? What changed for him? Well, it says there that when he finally came to his senses, we can say, well, he came to his senses. He realized he made a stupid mistake. But what, what was it that changed? He came to his senses because he suddenly realized that what he had been thinking about his father and what his father was like was not really true. Suddenly he thought, you know what, actually, I thought my dad just was there limiting me, keeping me from the inheritance. He was some authority figure, whatever he thought about his dad. But now he sits there in his pigsty and he thinks, you know what, actually, now come to think of it, dad is actually good. Even his hired servants are better off than me over here. Yeah, he's actually good to his servants. And something in his mind begins to change about what his dad's really like. And it's based on that change of mind that he decides, I'm going to go back home. And here's the point. When, why does he go home? Everything changes when you change about your mind about God the Father. See, sometimes, our, this is the way it works. Our actions are determined by our attitude. And our attitude is determined by how we think or what we believe. Okay? So what's going on inside of you, how you've thought about something, the conclusions you've come to in your, in your mind, will determine how your attitude, and attitude is really this idea of how you position yourself in relation to something or someone. And the way you position yourself is going to determine how you act or behave towards them. And so this son was thinking all wrong about his father. And it was only when he's changed his thinking that his attitude changed and then his actions changed. See, Christianity is not about just behavior modification. It's like, let me act differently. Let me be at home. Because you know, if you've read the story, you know that you can be at home in the father's house, but still not know the father's heart, i.e. there were two sons in the story. So it's not just about being there and acting right and saying the right things. You need to change your mind about things. And this is what the scripture says about God. It says in Romans 2 verse 4, deep theological revelation kind of doctrine, whatever book. It says this, do you not realize that all the wealth of his extravagant kindness, God's extravagant kindness. Now, if you read a different, this is from the Passion Translation, so it's got a bit more passion in it. The regular translation says something like, don't you know that the goodness and the kindness of God leads us to repentance? But sometimes we just have to think differently, right? That's why it's good just sometimes to read different translations. Listen, Jesus didn't speak in old King James English and nor in the NIV, by the way. So, so read a bit wider because you, sometimes we just need to get out of our rut, out of our familiarity. We become so familiar with language that it doesn't do anything for us anymore. Just stay with me and we'll get deeper into that. He says, do you not realize that all the wealth of His, God's extravagant kindness, is meant to melt your heart and lead you to repentance? So the message, the gospel, is uh, you, you engage with the gospel when you when you start to change your mind about what God is like and who He is. Repentance. Everyone say repentance. Did you hear that on the news this week, the word repentance? No. Because it's not a very, but, but, but here's what it means. Literally, it's the Greek word metanoia. Okay, it means literally a change of mind and heart that results in a change of action. But you've got to change your mind and heart about two things. Just as the prodigal son had to. First of all, change your mind about the Father, about God, what He is like. And secondly, and I'm not saying they, the first, they could be interchangeable. Right? Sometimes you change your mind about, the second thing you ought to change your mind about is sin or the pigsty. It's not that good. Right? I don't want to be here anymore. So once you have a change of mind and heart towards sin and towards God, then you can have repentance. Because then you can turn from what you don't want anymore and turn to what you do want. And so this son, the change, and I want us to get this, the change that will happen in your my life if, is if when we have, if we have true repentance. It's not just, oh, I'm sorry for what I've done. I feel bad about it. It's wrong. There's some set of laws that tells me it's wrong, so I must now conform to those laws. No, 
Repentance is much more than that. It's a breaking of the heart that is, I've, I've actually, I've, I've, I've wandered away from the very love that I am looking for and longing for. I've left the Father and I've pursued something which I thought would satisfy. But like sin always does, it deceived me. It's destroying me. It cheated me. It steals, kills, and destroys. It never delivers what it promises. I've seen it for what it is, and I want to go back to my Father. Everything changes when you change your mind about what God is like and who He is. And when you change your mind about sin. When those two things are in place, change can happen. Then you, you begin this, this journey of going home to my father. So the first reason he went home was, I think, because he changed his mind about what his father is really like. And he saw the real effect of sin. I think the second reason is because every one of us really long for home. Mm -hmm. We long for home. Home is... I mean, science asks the question, like, where do I come from? You know, how did we get here? But the soul asks a different question. It asks, like, whose am I? Who do I belong to? The soul is, is, is much more concerned with relationship than it is with creation and, and the, the process. As important as that is. But there's a deeper question that's, that, that Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins cannot answer for you. It's like, whose am I? Where's home? You all know that man, you, when you go traveling somewhere and things go wrong, I mean, knowing where home is is one of the most secure things that you can have in your life. Where's home? I was reading the story. Did you hear the story that was uh, printed in a Madrid newspaper? It says, there's a Spanish story of a father and a son who had become estranged. The son ran away, and the father set off to find him. He searched for months to no avail. Finally, in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an advert in a Madrid newspaper. The advert read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 Pecos showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. It's true, isn't it? Augustine said it this way, Our hearts, O Lord, are restless until they find their rest in Thee. There's something in us that's looking to go home, that's looking to go home. I'm here to tell you that home, the Father has a home for you. The Father has home for you. The Father is longing for you. Just like Jesus told the story to reveal what God is like and, and who He is. One of the revelations that Jesus brought into this world with Him. Last week we saw that how Jesus was the exact representation of God in this world. If you're looking for God, look to Jesus. And you'll see what He is like, through his, what God is like through His teaching, through His life, through His, his actions. Um, but Jesus also came to reveal God as Father, as Abba. When His disciples asked Him, Lord, teach us how to pray. How did they start? How did he start? All right. Our Father who is in heaven. Now, that might sound like to us, we've repeated this thing so many times, we don't even think about it. To them, that was revolutionary. I mean, there's a glimpse in the Old Testament of, of God being Father. In the Psalms, it says, I think Psalm 65, it says, He is a Father to the fatherless. There's a glimpse of that. This hope, and, and that's what the Old Testament is about, just these glimpses of, of what the new is going to bring in its fullness. And there is a glimpse in the Old Testament, but there's not too much of this Father heart of God in the Old. But when you come and Jesus steps into this world, He introduces this idea that God is your Father. He is Abba, Daddy, Daddy. That's amazing. And they were like, wow, that's a new thing. This is, this is amazing. Um, so Jesus introduces God as Abba, as Father. Um, in John chapter 14, when, when Jesus has just said, and we'll look at this in a moment, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. Again, he's saying the reconciliation is towards the Father because that's who we're longing for. And Philip says to him in response, he says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Okay? 
we, we, there's this idea that if, if, if I'm longing, this is the love I'm longing for. If I could just find the Father, if I could just find home, um, that'll be enough for me. And, and what does Jesus answer? This is what he answers. He says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus says, here's the Father. I'm representing him to you. And as we look at Jesus' teaching in the New Testament, we see that God is perfectly good, that the Father is kind even to the unthankful and to the evil, that the Father lavishes His love on us, that it's because of His great love for us that, we, that Christ came to die on the cross for us. This is, this is Jesus revealing the goodness of God. He says, hey, you guys, even you who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more, there's a there is more statement, right? How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? Jesus reveals the Father as a good, perfect Father. And if you've done follow one, anyone done follow one here? Hands up quickly. Just There's more of you, okay? Like some of you forgotten. <laughs> what are the three things you need to know? Shout out quickly. The three things you need to know about God in order to relate to Him well. God is prodigal. God is love. God is Father. Now you can dig deeper into this. Come and join us. The next follow course is in November. Follow one starts for four weeks and on for November the 12th, I think it is, uh, second Monday of. It's an amazing journey we'll take on the follow one course. But here's the deal. If you want to relate to God the Father well, you need to know Him as He is love. Not just has love, but He is love. He is Father, and He is prodigal in His love and grace towards you. Now, he has a, there is a problem, though, when you talk about God the Father, because some of us and some of you, you more, your response to this may be, man, if God is like my Father, no thank you. So we've got to think a little bit about what is keeping you from experiencing God as Father, as good Father, as perfect Father. What is it? What are some of the things that that cause us to struggle to receive and relate to God as Father. Right? There's this term called cognitive dissonance. Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> it's a real problem for, for many people, but a real problem for Christians, for people of faith. It's this idea that what you say or do is disconnected, is... is uh, it's. There's a tension between what we say or do and what we really think or believe. The dissonance is, is uh, the word dissonance means disharmony or tension. So uh, this is what happens. We get into different environments. You do that at work too. You do that with your family. You do that at, in a community like this where we have a a way of doing things. So you step into a community and you know what is expected from you. You know what your workmates expect from you. So you start to say things that makes you fit in. You start to act in a way that makes you fit in. But it's, if it's contrary to what you really think or believe or value, you have what's called cognitive dissonance. And you know, you're living in this, this split world. And this is a problem for us. What was the last song we just sang today? You're a good... I'm going to break out again. <laughs> Somebody help me. You're a good, good father. Now you see, those words can come out of your mouth, but I want to ask you, do you really believe that in your heart? Because they're questions, hey. The questions, if you are so good, Why? Why is this happening to me? Why am I struggling? Why have I got arthritis for 35 years? Why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? If you're so good. So some of those come from internal, personal experience, right? You, why, why have I not got a job? Why have I not got enough money? Why have I not got a, the, the life that I was longing for? Why have my prayers been answered? Come on, let's face those. Because if you don't face those and, you know, faith can't fix what you won't face. You are only as strong as you are honest. If you face it, faith can fix it. 
can take you through, can take you deeper. So you, we have these deep questions, and here's what we do. We just plaster them with a couple of Scripture verses. You know? All things work together for good for those who love God. I love you, Jesus. And we keep repeating and repeating and denying and denying what's really going on inside of us. And what really makes this word work, and I'm, not, I'm totally into confessing this word, I'm totally in, but this word is supposed to be, it is alive and it's active, sharper than a two-edged sword which goes where? It pierces even to the deepest thoughts and intents of your heart. And when you let it in there, that's when it begins to do what? It begins to work repentance. It begins to work change. It begins to reveal what God is really like and His ways and His ways that are too far beyond our understanding. And we start to see the eternal rather than just the temporal. And we start to see His kingdom rather than just this earth. And we start to get a new perspective on, on what this world and this life is really all about. And once that begins to work into our thinking and into our believing, God, guess what? Then I'm th man, now... I can step out. Now my attitude changes, and then my actions change. I just want to encourage us. Let's not live in a world where we say and do things and act in certain ways just to be comfortable and accepted, but actually inside we have not changed our mind about anything. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Truth comes to us, and that's what sets us free when we have transformation now when it comes to the father there are two reasons why that or two causes of this dissonance thing right the one is our experience with our natural fathers if they've if it's been negative and i just thank god for amazing fathers in this house and you might have had a great father and this is not a necessarily an issue for you but many of us did not have positive father experiences can i actually just say none of us have had perfect father experiences See, fathers are supposed to define you, not destroy you. Fathers are supposed to launch you, not to limit you. But often it just gets mixed up. We have distant fathers, absent fathers, abusive fathers, don't care fathers, strict fathers, controlling fathers, all that sort of stuff. Just, and when you are shaped with that, and then you hear this preacher telling you that God loves you and and, and he's a good father. You're like, I can't filter that. I've got father wounds and I've got father vacuums. And these hinder me from just saying, yes, I believe God is good. And so this is why we have to leave our father and mother and cleave to him. You know, marriage is, is just a, a, a glimpse of, of our relationship with God. It's like a man shall leave his father and his mother. That word leave is, you've got to leave that behind, abandon that, disentangle yourself from that so that you can cleave to God, the Father. I had to do that in my life. Oh, boy, did I have to do that in my life. And when I came to Christ and I, and I was saved, this, this was the beautiful thing that my family, I grew up, you know, in a, in a I always wanted to be part of another family. We grew up in this little town, and um, we were Germans, so our culture was so different. There was a lot of business business happening in my life. And then I became a Christ follower, and I remember my parents coming to see me in Cape Town. I was in the Navy, and I'd become a Christian, and I'd had this all renewing. And, uh, and uh, we were going to see our, our, the pastors of the church where I got saved, and they'd become good family and friends to me. And on our way driving... On the N1 in Cape Town, my mother turns around to me. My dad's driving, and she says, Wolfie, are you embarrassed by us? You know, and in that moment, I had to just realize that so much of my life had been shaped by how I felt about my parents, how I reacted to them, my attitude towards them. And in that moment, there was true repentance in my heart, and something changed. Like there, and I and I was able to let go all the stuff that I felt towards them and and all that, and and really 
connect with Father God, and then from that love, just give them love like amazing. I'm going to see my mom this next weekend. It's her 80th birthday. I'll send you a video, okay? She's amazing. She got saved after that. But, you know, you, I don't know what your story is with your father, but if it's a mess, you can, I can just guarantee you have potentially some resistance, some obstacles of, of really relating to God the Father because of that. I pray that even today and in this next week, some revelation, some understanding will come to you. Some healing will come to you. Come to the follow course if you haven't been there. We deal with this a little bit there, but, but uh, speak to someone in your connect. Pray with someone, but leave your father behind. Bless them. Don't, don't walk away in judgment because the same judgment you judge them with will follow you. you the, the challenge is we call to honor them. Young people, Honor your father and your mother so it'll be well with you and you will live long in the land. But instead of honoring them, often because they're not perfect, we end up judging them. And then we have a huge problem and we have to forgive them. That is the process. Second reason quickly is the father of lies. Okay, there is a devil and Jesus calls him the father of lies. The main thing he lies to you about is the nature of God, what God is really like. He says things like, did God really say causing you to doubt his words, God's words. Did God really say, you will be like God? He's tr causing you to doubt and, and have a confusion about God's nature. That's what he does. He lies. He's, he, he, you, you, you long to be a son or a daughter, a child, but you, the only thing he offers you is slavery. He, you can never be his son. You will always be his slave. So I want you to think about what are the lies that you've believed about God? Empty philosophies. They float around all the time. You listen to Stephen Fry on his video and going off about how bad God is and what a monster is. You listen to that stuff and it begins to lodge, lodge, lodge in your head. You read a bit of Richard Dawkins and all that stuff. It begins to lodge, lodge. If you don't wrestle with that, and come to a good apologetic a reasoning about why that is a lie and why there is a different worldview that explains God as a good, perfect, loving God, you're going to have cognitive dissonance. You're going to be worshiping like this, but it's just going to be your actions and empty words, but your heart will never be touched. And that is not the way you're supposed to live this life. You're supposed to experience the lavish love of God, the prodigal love of God. You want to get rid of all that stuff that separates you from Him. Let's start to close this. Jesus reveals the Father, but also unites us as restored children. This is what He says. Don't let your hearts be troubled. If your heart is troubled, here's Jesus saying, don't let it be troubled. Trust in God. Put your trust in Him. Lean on Him with your whole human personality, your mind, your emotions, your will. Lean on Him. Trust Him. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. Jesus says, come. You can come home. No matter what pigsty you've been in, you can come home. And then He says, I am going to prepare a place for you. Can you see this connecting with the story? I'm going to prepare. You can come home. And then He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That is radically exclusive, would you say? He's saying there's no one else. You can't come through Muhammad. You can't come through all your Hindu gods. You can't come through your goodness, your righteousness. You can't come through your religion, your laws, your keeping. There's no other way. Only through Jesus. But it's also as exclusive as it is. It's as inclusive as you can get it. He says everyone can come. Friend, you can come home through Jesus. Here's how. It says, he came to his own people in John 1. He came to his own people, but even his own people rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become what? Children of God. For him to be your father, you've got to be his child. And you can be his child. By believing in him, believing in the gospel. And then it says this, this is what John says, this would be the result of, of coming to him and being his child. John says in 1 John 3, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Let's read that last sentence together. And that is who, what we are. Okay, this, is the, this is the result. So that's, that's where we're going to end today.
But we're going to turn this into a prayer. You know, we talk about reaping in this church. Our read a portion. You're going to do that this week. Read, reap, okay? Reap Luke 15. Just go back there. Say, God, I want to know you. Show yourself to me. Examine it. We've done a bit of that. Apply it. We've done a bit of that. Pray it is when you talk the scripture back to God. So I'm going to leave those two up there. And I'm going to ask you just to, in your, on your own, just pray that back to God for a minute. Can you do that? Because that's truth. He says, if you, you can reject him, maybe right now you feel like you're rejecting him. Maybe you're not sure. Or you can receive and believe him and then receive the right, the authority to be called a child of God. How would you, re- how would you pray that? Maybe say, thank you, God, that I could know you that I could respond to you, that I can believe and receive you, and thank you that I have the right to be called a child of God. And then there might be a response in saying, oh man, how amazing it is that the Father has lavished his love on me and that I could be called a child of God, and that is who I am.